Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. What I would like to do now is convexity adjustments. And maybe it's a bit broader topic, yeah, but in today's session, we cannot cover everything and maybe just touch a few parts. But what we will see is that we can generalize the stuff that was going on on what we saw for the quantum. What happens if you move from one payment unit to another payment unit? And maybe we start first by observing that there are some kind of natural payment units that are naturally connected to the index that you pay. And I have a very nice table that um, <clears throat> is showing that a lot of the stuff that we did so far can be somehow standardized uh, in the sense that you observe an index, you have a function of the index, and you have some kind of payment unit, and they are connected. And what was happening in the quantum is that we decoupled this, we moved to an unnatural payment, yeah, and you need maybe an additional modeling quantity for this yeah, other, other unit. Let me start with uh, a small motivation, yeah, the convexity adjustment, and also why is it called the convexity adjustment? All these things, which sometimes come under different names, are convexity adjustments. For example, the quantum adjustment, which we saw for the quantum caplet, but also the in arrears, whoops, the in arrears adjustment or the constant maturity swap adjustment, they are all such convexity adjustments. As a motivation, remember what we had for a floater, so paying a floating rate. That was the first financial product where we paid something stochastic in the future. And there was the nice result that we can value this even without having a model. Yeah, we can value this by just observing today's zero Cooper bond prices. So we were paying the forward rate for the period from TI to TI plus one, fixed at the beginning of the pay, a period, paid at the end of the period. And our little theorem showed us that the value is just the forward rate observed at evaluation time multiplied with the zero copper bond also observed at evaluation time. So it's just the index observed today multiplied with the pay of unit observed today because this guy, the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the period is the pay of unit. I pay you one unit of this thing here at the end of the period. So it was sufficient just to know the forward rate at evaluation time. Yeah? For example, capital T0, if that is now our, our evaluation time. So I do not know, uh, I do not need a stochastic process. Yeah? I do not need a model for L. And the proof was more or less like this here. Uh, and there were some nice little things inside. Okay, so what do I have? I have the index, let's call it Li, yeah, for period Ti plus one to Ti. I pay this index in units. <laughs> yeah, so what is the unit? I pay it at the end of the period in one unit of domestic currency. So I could write here P Ti plus one observed in Ti plus one. Yeah, so to make that clear, yeah. So this encodes what I pay, one unit of domestic currency, but it also encodes when do I pay. Yeah? It is the zero copper bond that 
matures at the end of the period. And in your evaluation formula, this is the time where you divide with the numeria. So I pay in units of E T I plus one. So we had also this little trick since the fixing of my forward rate. Okay, so the fixing of my forward rate is here in TI. So because of that, I can actually move everything here to TI because I know that after TI, this here is a constant yeah? and this here is of course a martingale. So you could move to everything to TI. That was not such a crucial part. Yeah, maybe it's just nice. Then the second trick was that we choose the PTI plus one as a numeria. So we choose the PTI plus one as a numeria. So I define PTI plus one as my numeria n, which then led to the nice thing that here the payment unit and the numeria is canceling such that I only have the L left under my expectation. So the nice thing is that then this numeria does not appear and the payoff unit also does not appear in my expectation. All I need to know is the distribution of L. The second lucky thing is that my L is a martingale under that numeria. So there were two things coming together. The first thing was that we could cancel this here. Okay, so we cancel, we cancel here our numeria with the pay of unit. So that was the first thing. We could do this, we can do this always if we make the right choice of the numeria. And there was the second lucky thing. My Li is a martingale under that numeria. So I know the expectation. Yeah, this is a linear payoff here. So I know the expectation. I know that this is then Li observed today. Okay, and you know, in the evaluation, there is in front the numeria at evaluation time. So there would be here the numeria at evaluation time. But I just left this out here. My point is that we had two, these two things here and they somehow have to fit together. And we saw for the quanto, it didn't fit. And that made the evaluation a bit complicated. So somehow the index that you pay is associated with the unit in which you pay. There's a link between the two. Okay, two lucky things came together. The payoff is such that the chosen numeria drops out of the expectation operator and the remaining term under the expectation is a martingale under that specific numeria. So I call this then maybe the natural payoff unit. Yeah? So that somehow the natural unit in which I should pay this index. And if the natural payoff unit yeah, is modified to an unnatural one, that gives then maybe rise to this convexity adjustment to the stuff that happened for the quantum. Yeah, let me fix a little bit notation. So I consider some kind of index. So I have here my X, yeah, which is now my index. That could be the L times Ti plus one minus Ti. Yeah? So some or times T2 minus T1. So some, some index, yeah? so which I fix in T1. And I assume that this index is, um, a martingale under Qn, so for the numeria n. So n would be somewhat the natural 
payment unit. So now I consider a financial product that pays in units of this N, the natural asset. A payment can be at a later time. Yeah. So you saw on the slide that actually the payment time here, yeah, this is not so relevant. Yeah, yeah. So you can move always as if you would pay in that unit at the fixing time. So I assume that I pay this in T2. And then I pay some function. So there is some function F here. Oops. I pay some function F of this index in the units of N at some later time. T2. This thing with the function here is then here my coupon C fixed in T1, which I pay in units of N2. So let's consider this setup. Uh, we could make the function more complicated, could be the identity, then it's just like with my floater, could be maximum of x minus k, yeah, then it's like an option, could be also some nonlinear function. Uh, my x is some index, like the forward rate could also be the swap rate, and my n is some traded asset, which I can choose as a numeria. If f is linear, so special case, yeah, so note f is here linear, then choose now n as a numeraire, you see that the numeraire cancels in the expectation. If you would like to value this, you pay c in units of n divided by n, it cancels. And c is f of x, but it is linear. Expectation of a linear function is the linear function of the expectation. It is just the c of zero. So if this function is linear, you have our result, which we observed for the floater, actually for all indices, we have the value of the indices index today, multiplied with the value of the payment unit today. So that was the situation which we had for the floater, where our X is L times the period length, our F is the identity, and N is the bond that pays at the end of the period. <clears throat> um, the things that we did for the options, yeah, like caplet and swaption, that actually also relied on this situation, but the function f was then piecewise linear. And if you consider the Black Schultz model, F piece was linear, maximum of L minus K and zero. Yeah? The caplet, for example, is piece was linear payoff function. Then we assumed that the index was log normal for the black model. And we assumed that the index was normal for the Bachelier model. And we could then derive an analytic formula, yeah? black formula, Bachelier formula. So that was the setup. We had the same situation. Index and payment unit were related. It was the natural payoff unit for our index. You can compile now a nice little table and see that this situation is or holds here for many different financial products. Also, if you go back to the Black Schultz model for a stock, if you write it in our much nicer form, the one that we did in one of the last sessions, the generalized form, where we did not consider the stock as the underlying object, we considered the forward. The forward is the stock divided actually by the zero proper bond, maturing at the exercise um, of the option. And our numeraire was then the numeraire that paid one unit at the exercise of the option. That was our numeraire. Okay, that's the three cuba bond that matures at the exercise of the option. So we we moved uh, 
to this setup and the Black-Scholes formula looked much nicer in this setup. So for our caplet, our underlying index was the L and we paid in units of the zero one that matures at the end of the period. For the swaption, the index was the swap rate. Okay, so this is here the swap rate. And we paid in units of the swap annuity. And recall, the swap rate is a martingale if you move under the to the equivalent martingale measure corresponding to the numeraire being the swap annuity. This guy is a martingale if you move to the measure where the zero that matures at the end of the period. Uh, if you choose that guy as, as the numeraire. Uh, you can also go to our foreign caplet or the foreign forward. So that's actually here. The FX forward, yeah, paying. Yeah, okay, that, that's also a nice example here. The FX forward, it pays you the zero copper bond converted to domestic currency you know, at the time capital T. Your numeraire is the zero copper bond that pays at capital T in domestic currency. This here is a martingale under that numeraire. Then you can consider a linear function applied to this, which will give us the forward, the floater, the swap. You know, the swap is also just exchanging the swap rate against the constant. Or you can have a piecewise linear function, which will give us an option, the caplet or the swaption. There is a little thing that I don't like about this table. It's uh, a bit inconsistent. Um, the nice thing is that the underlying here is a unitless quantity. Yeah. So this here is a stock divided by a zero copper bond. So both has units one ca domestic currency. So if I divide, I get a unitless quantity. And this also makes sense because I apply a function to this unitless quantity. The function could be linear, it could be piecewise linear, but it could also be nonlinear. And applying a function, a nonlinear function to a quantity that has a unit is maybe a strange thing. But applying to a quantity that has no unit, that is unitless, then it's maybe okay. Yeah, I get a square of this. And I apply then my pay of units. So this guy, here has the unit one currency. This is a bit inconsistent because an interest rate has the unit one divided by time. And I wrote here the unit, I multiply with the period length to the pay of unit. And you could think that this is maybe the right way to do it because I pay you that many units yeah, as long as the period is. But if you think that the index should be a unitless quantity, it's maybe much better to write this period length here to the L. Yeah? So it's L times Ti plus one minus Ti paid in units of this zero copper bond. So if I move that guy to here or that guy to here, everything would be fine. Maybe here I have to multiply the K also with Ti plus one minus Ti, okay? I, because K is a rate, but now I pay you maximum of the rate times the period length, okay? That's trivial, trivial adjustment. But what about the swap rate? Yeah? If you look at the definition of the swap annuity, so here, this guy, what is the swap annuity? The swap annuity is, okay, let me, let me write this here. So the swap annuity is the sum of the zero copper bonds that pay at the end of the periods of the swap multiplied with the respective period lengths. So this is a linear combination of zero copper bonds. Well, if you would divide here 
with say, for example, the whole period length, Tn minus T1, then you would see that the swap annuity divided by Tn minus T1 is just the weighted average of the zero copper bonds. So it's a little bit like here that I have a zero copper bond in all situations. I also have a zero copper bond here, but it is not a zero copper bond. It is a weighted average. Yeah? And the sum of the weights is one. If you divide here with the sum over all periods. So that's a very nice natural thing. And that's the reason why my table should look like that. Here, the underlying X is unitless in all cases. Huh? So I have a unitless quantity. Yeah? So L is an interest rate. It is something per time, but I multiply with the period length. And the unit in which I pay is always a traded asset and not some traded asset multiplied with time, you know, with seconds, yeah, what's that? Okay. And for the swap and the swap annuity, I just propose that you remove the unit. Okay, S has the unit one divided by time. So you have to multiply with some time lengths. And I would propose to multiply here with the lengths of the whole period from the first starting to the last ending. And you divide here by that. Okay, if you then also apply this little factor here to the K, yeah, then you see this is just the same, yeah? S times Tn minus T1 minus K times Tn minus T1 multiplied with A divided by Tn minus T1. So it goes away. So I have just rewritten this in a much more consistent uh, way. And nice little feature, these things here are all very similar. They are a single zero copper bond encoding when we pay it. Yeah? And this here is we pay it in a certain weighted average of times. That for the swap, this is the right factor. Uh, actually, you can see it later if you look at the so-called constant maturity swap adjustment. Uh, you see that this is a nice scaling factor here that should occur to the to the swap rate. Okay, this is a nice summary of the situation we had so far, except for our quanto caplet. We always had a unitless index that was associated with this natural payoff unit. So let's give it a short definition. Yeah. So I say that a payoff if is in its natural unit. If I can write it here in this form, I have some function of my index multiplied. Yeah. The function could be nonlinear. Uh, nonlinear multiplied with my uh, Numeraire n, uh, n is a numeraire, and my index is a martingale under the corresponding measure. Okay, just a small summary for the floater. Saying that I pay in units of the zero cover bond uh, has the advantage that I not only encode the units in the sense that it is one unit of currency, so the amount and also the currency, but it also encodes the payment time. So actually um, paying in units of this zero copper bond makes it then independent of the payment time. So for the floater, it was equivalent to say that we pay uh, multiplied with PTI plus one observed in TI in TI. The valuation of this natural payoff, okay, so um, we did it, is nice because the numeraire will cancel out of the expectation. And all you need to know is then the distribution of X. So for the special case of our log normal, 
Assumption for X, wie der Ralf black schulz formular for the special case of our normal assumption for X, wie derived bachelier formula if the function is piecewise linear. So maximum of X minus K and zero is just a special version of a piecewise linear, but you can uh, generalize this. And yeah, if it is linear, the function, okay, then I just get F of X zero times N of zero. For the case that you have a piecewise linear function, you can very nicely derive a generalized Black-Schultz formula. For example, you assume that your process is log normal and you just have a general piecewise linear function. Yeah, then you need to calculate here the expectation of this piecewise linear function of a log normal random variable. So you just cut the integral into the parts yeah, for where the function is linear, lower bound, upper bound, yeah, and we we'll see it as in the derivation of the Black Schultz formula. And you get some different phi of d pluses, yeah, say phi of di's for the different boundaries, uh, so you can derive a very general analytic formula for all piecewise linear payoff functions. And if you approximate any function by a piecewise linear, yeah, that's already maybe a nice analytic approximation. Yeah, that's maybe a nice numerical method to value almost arbitrary European payoff. Okay, so let's... Um, conclude the session by looking at convexity adjustment. So what happens now if the payment unit is not the natural one? So what I will do is I move now from the unit N. So now I use maybe the queen color for the payment unit. Yeah, Previously, I always used queen for the index, blue for the unit, but now Queen is the natural unit, and maybe the blue one is some other asset, some other unit that I will use. And instead of paying now, say, my index X multiplied with the unit N, which is the natural one, I now consider paying X in the units M. Yeah, what is happening if I change the unit? Changing the unit can mean paying in a different currency, like for the quantum. We already saw this guy, but it can also mean paying at a different time. So paying at a wrong time. And a nice example for this is the LIBOR in arrears. So, Maybe first I have to explain a little bit the name LIBOR in arrears. So it is a forward rate that is fixed actually at the end of the period. But equivalently, you could say that this is like paying at the beginning of the period. So there are now two interpretations to this. Assume you have your period discretization here. Okay, so this here is maybe ti minus one. This here is ti. This here is ti plus one. Okay, and you can say that you have an interest rate that is almost always for the same length of the period. So ti minus ti minus one. It's the same length as ti plus one minus ti. Yeah? So for example, assume that this year is six months, then this year should also be six months. If you have an interest rate for this period here, so this year is my L ti, ti plus one, you could say that you pay it for 
the past period. So I pay this interest rate for the past period at the end of the period. So I pay at the end of the period. So that means here payment time TI, the end of the period, but I pay you this interest rate, the queen interest rate multiplied with the period length that is associated here with this period. So I observe the interest rate. So I move on and I observe the interest rate. And when I'm at the end of the period, I pay the interest rate, but the interest rate is fixed at the end of the period. So it is fixed in arrears. So this is actually the interpretation in the market. Yeah? So you observe three months interest rate, but then you move on. Yeah, and instead of fixing it at the beginning of the period, paying it at the end of the period, you fix it at the end of the period and pay it for the past period. This interpretation is actually, if you look at the picture, equivalent to say that you pay the interest rate for the future period, not at the natural time. The natural time would be here the time ti plus one, you pay it at the beginning of the period. So the payment is here. So you fix the interest rate at the beginning of that period here, and you pay it at the beginning of the period. So the two things are actually equivalent. Yeah? So fixing at the end of the period and paying at the end of the period is the same as fixing at the beginning of the period, but paying instead of the end at the beginning. If you just consider the two periods, this one and that one. And the second interpretation is a bit nicer for us. Huh? So small remark, yeah, the, the name in arrears refers to the interpretation that the interest rate is considered for the past period, and it is fixed at the end of the period. So in arrears, fixed in arrears, fixed at the end. But if I now for simplicity assume that the past period and this actually current period, the period for which this rate is originally, yeah, it is the rate originally for this six months period that comes in the future. If these are just the same blanks, yeah. Then I can also just consider paying multiples of the future period ti plus one minus ti, yeah. So because this length here is the same as this length here, I can just replace this factor here with ti plus one minus ti. Okay, so then you see, I pay the interest rate fixed at the beginning of the period, at the beginning of the period, so I pay at the wrong time. If the two period lengths are not uh, the same, this difference is just um, a constant scaling factor. I would like to use this second interpretation because it is a little bit nicer in the de derivation. So I consider now the financial product that pays my interest rate for the current period and it pays it in advanced. Yeah? So it pays at the beginning of the period. So issue is that I have the right index, the right object L, but I'm paying it at the wrong time. The natural one would be TI plus one. No? Pay the interest rate fixed at the beginning of the period at the end of the period. Okay, so that's um, equivalent to the in arrears fixing, yeah, the in advance payment. And let's look at this product. Let's look at paying L at the wrong time. So I pay in the wrong unit. Yeah? So this here is the payment unit, PTI, 
and it should be actually the payment unit PTI plus one. So I pay in the wrong unit. So what do we have? I pay now L times TI plus one. Maybe I use now that color here from my index. Multiplied with the wrong unit PTI, huh? everything observed in TI. This is paid in TI. If you plug in now, say the change of units. So I just divide here with the natural one and I multiply here again with the natural one. Then you see that the ratio that I have here in front is actually the change of unit that has been applied to the natural payoff where you pay the index in units of the zero cover bond that pays at the end of the period. So the ugly thing is that somebody has changed the payment unit inserting this factor here. So this is the bond that matures at the beginning of the period divided by the bond that matures at the end of the period. So this thing here can be expressed, whoops. So this thing here can be expressed in terms of a forward rate. Yeah? A forward rate is the bond that matures at the beginning of the period minus the bond that matures at the end of the period divided by the bond that matures at the end of the period. Okay, so it's actually exactly this ratio minus one divided by the period length. So if I multiply with the period length and if I add one, this is exactly this ratio. So this ratio there above is one plus the forward rate from TI to TI plus one. You see everything here is observed in TI. Yeah? So that's also the observation time of this interest rate. And I multiply now with the natural unit. I multiply my index. So now I can multiply this out. You see, I have my index multiplied with this one here. And then I have the index. My index is L times the time period. And you see, this is nice here. It's again, L times the time period. So I have my index squared. Okay, multiplied with the natural unit. So you see that I can alternatively interpret here. Instead of paying the right index at the wrong time or put differently in a wrong unit, I could also say that I have here a nonlinear function, a nonlinear function of the index. So if my index, the natural one, my if my index is called X, if my index is called X, then this here is a nonlinear function. It's X plus X squared. So I could say I pay a nonlinear function of my index in the natural unit. <coughs> so either I pay here in the wrong unit. So that means the index is not a martingale under this unit. Or I pay in the natural unit. So which means the index is a martingale under this unit. But now I pay a nonlinear function of this index. And this function here is convex. So the difference in the valuation comes now from having a convex function, not a linear one, a convex one. This is my convexity adjustment. So in the second interpretation, there is an additional term. And that additional term here is a convex function and it induces an adjustment to the evaluation which we will call for that reason, convexity adjustment. Yeah, what's the value? Yeah, so let's 
apply our evaluation theorem. Let's choose now the natural guy. Let's choose now the bond that pays at the end of the period here for my index as the numeraire. Take the expectation, plug in my nonlinear function. So I have this term L times period length squared here, but I also have the term L times period length. That is the natural one. This is my numeraire. The numeraire again cancels. Okay, that's nice. This guy is a martingale under this numeraire. So I know the value is just the value of the index observed today multiplied with the numeraire observed today. And for the second part, okay, I just have its expectation of L times period length squared. So you see for the second part, it's actually related to the variance of L. So for the quantum, it was a covariance term that appeared. Here it is a variance term. It is related to the variance. So I need a model for the distribution. I do not need a model for the distribution here for the martingale part, for the linear part on this martingale. But here you would need some some kind of model. So if it would be log, if it would be normal, yeah, you see there is a sigma squared popping out. Huh? So. Um, uh, a variance term, or actually you could also say a covariance term. It's the covariance between L and L itself. So like our quantum adjustment, paying in the different currency here, paying at a different time creates this, this additional term, which we call convexity adjustment. Yeah, we have a little bit time left. Let's do the general formulation, try to elaborate this a little bit. And then maybe in the next session, we can derive a few formulas under special assumption. For example, the process being log normal yeah, and the change of numeraire process also having a certain shape. Yeah. And we can generalize what we did for the quanto uh, to a general situation. And there's also then a nice little trick where you can recover this thing that we just have an adjusted Black-Scholes formula. Uh, you can write this down very general. But today, yeah, so maybe since we only have a few minutes left, let's just lay the foundation. So I, I said change of numeraire, but actually it is change of payment units at first. So consider the general set up, I have my index X here, and there is a natural payment unit associated with this index, which is the N. So it means that X is a Q N martingale, or if it is not a martingale, assume that you have some analytic valuation formula, V, we subscript n that allows you to value this pay payoff f of x of t when this is paid in the natural unit n. So I have also a function f here. So I have this, this is a v. So maybe I make the v also the queen one because this is now the valuation of say some natural payment. Let's move to a different payment unit. So I move to another traded asset M. I pay the same linear or nonlinear function F of that index, but now in the different unit. And I call this value or this payoff. You know, at first it is a payoff. I call it V subscript M. And the question is, what is actually the value of this financial product in zero? So can I establish some kind of relation to this 
value for which I maybe already know some formula. Yeah, the VM, I can just express it. Say, for example, under my natural measure, the one with QN. So I use my numeria N here. Yeah, it's just the payment, which is F of my index, but now paid, unfortunately, in units of M divided by the numeria N. So you see the numeria is here not canceling. And what you somehow get here, already here at this slide, you see it, you get a correlation term between a function of the index. So this is a stochastic process that is created by the index and the change of payment unit. Yeah, So expectation of these two quantities, it's a correlation covariance term. So you can move here. I'm calling this here generally uh, a little bit general. I'm considering here paying in T star. Of course, you can move to T. Yeah? So you have that this is just the M in T divided by the N in T because M divided by N is a martingale under QN. Okay, so I have this situation. So if Vn is the value process, you know, paying in the natural unit. So you see here, I'm paying in the natural unit. This is now my value process V subscript N. And Vm is the value process paying in the unnatural unit. Okay, so for the Vn, I have that here, these two guys cancel. And I just have that this is expectation under QN of the index, function of the index. For the VM, you also have this. If you move to the different measure, you, know, you could move here to the equivalent martingale measure and you would have the same form as for the VN. Yeah, so it's function of the index. But now you are under a different a different measure. So, but I do not know the other measure or I do not know the index under the other measure. That was what we de had to derive for the quantum. So if I like to stay under the QN measure, it is that I have to divide the payoff, the unnatural payoff with the natural Numeria, and that gives me my valuation VM. Okay, so what is this guy here inside? So the VM divided by the N, this is a stochastic process. Yeah? So let's plug in here the VN. So note that now I write here Vn, but if I use Vn and I divide by the N and I multiply with the M, then this is just a more complicated rewriting of my Vm. This is the unnatural payment payoff. It's the natural payoff where I multiplied where I modified the payoff unit. Okay. And this is a stochastic process. So it is the initial value of the stochastic process plus the integral over the differential. Okay. The initial value now has here the value using the natural payoff unit. And what you have here is the integrated instantaneous covariance of the martingale of the natural valuation formula value process 
multiplied with the martingale of the change of numeraire. So that's the integrated covariance term. So you see that there is a relation between my valuation in the unnatural unit, my VM, and the valuation in the natural unit. So you have to multiply here. Okay, so what, what, I, what I do from this line here to that line is I multiply with the N0. Okay, so that goes here, goes away. And I take the expectation now. So taking expectation will give me the value of the VM times N, the, times N0. Okay, and the value of the VN, I cancel the N0, but here also multiplied with this ratio. So if the two units are different by a constant factor, of course, that constant factor will okay, occur. And then I get the expectation of the integral of these of this covariance term, the value process under the natural unit and the change of payment unit. And you see if you, for example, drop this guy because the initial value for both units here is maybe one, you see that there is an adjustment related to this covariance. And this is now our general form of the convexity adjustment. So I call this guy here the convexity adjustment. So now we can plug in some models yeah, and some assumptions where we have some more information of these stochastic processes and can find maybe nice formulas yeah, for the convexity adjustment. And let's do that next time. That was it for today.